You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast produced by Veteran Strategies and featuring conversations with fascinating and impactful men and women who have shaped our world, our communities, and our history. My name is Robert Vane, Principal of Veteran Strategies, and your host for our discussion. You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmond Construction, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. You may find all your sales and rental equipment needs at McAllister.com. We are pleased to announce our podcast is now a member of the All Indiana Podcast Network in partnership with Wish TV. You can find leaders and legends at all Indiana Podcast Network.com. Thinking of starting your own podcast or need to host a public meeting? Let Leaders and Legends LLC be your partner as you look for new ways to communicate your message. Please contact Chris Spangle and me at leadersandlegends.net. Thank you for joining us on the Leaders and Legends podcast. Our guest today is Allison Barber. PhD, as a matter of fact, President and Chief Operating Officer of the Indiana Fever, and that is only one of her amazing career stops. We are joined today by CEO Girl Scouts Central Indiana, Danielle Shockey. So we are going to turn it over to Danielle, as we always do. I will say this very quick, Allison, uh, before Danielle uh, takes you through the first half of the podcast. I have never, and I've never met you, ever. I have never heard your name mentioned without, oh my God, she's wonderful, <laughs> coming right behind it. Whether that's our good friend, Denny Sutherland, who we love, who we should thank because he helped make this podcast happen. Bill Benner, Eddie White, Jim Morris, Greg Ballard, the list goes on and on. So thank you very much for taking time to come on the Leaders and Legends podcast, Danielle. Hello, Allison. So good to see you. Thanks for joining us on Leaders and Legends. Thank you um, for having me. Yeah, I typically start with tell us a little about yourself or tell our listeners what it is you do and how you got here. But you've been described as someone who's had eight or more careers. So I don't want to start just there, although I do want to talk to you about um, you know, kind of your path and what has led you to be in the role leading the fever. But I do want to start with maybe just for our audience um, who, who may not know Allison Barber, as Robert said, because most everybody in the community does seem to know who you are. But for those who maybe don't, just tell them in a really quick sound bite um, what it means to be the president and CEO of the fever organization and just that little teeny bio of yourself to get us started. Well, thanks, and thanks for having me on this uh, podcast. What it means to be the president of the Indiana Fever is that every day I get to put my hand and my interest and energy to uh, working hard to build this franchise brand so that kids all over the state of Indiana would be motivated and inspired by our game of basketball played by you know these amazing athletes, and then also to build alignment and partnership as we think about issues of diversity and inclusion, you know, and girls having the opportunity to be a professional athlete, all of these things. Every day I wake up and think, how do we really excite and energize our state of Indiana around this wonderful game of basketball and specifically women's professional game? So it's a wonderful job. I love it. I never expected to be in sports, uh, but it's really a, a thrill. So I've, I've read, you know, quite a few of your interviews in the past and your bio and, and actually sports analogies um, and sports, it, it, like you said, the first time in basketball, but that's not new to you. So describe just a little bit, do you love basketball and where did that come from? Well, I grew up in Northwest Indiana. I do love basketball and, you know, I, Northwest Indiana as a kid, my parents, you know, cause they're good Hoosiers. They bought me my first basketball hoop and my first basketball it was the best Christmas gift I think I've ever gotten um, and you know I talk a lot about my dad and I would shoot hoops and I was fourth grade I guess and he would always say take it to the hoop kid take it to the hoop and I think you know that his idea behind that 
encouragement was if, the, if I got a little bit closer, I might actually make the basket. Uh, so it was a practical encouragement, but what it has played out to be for me really is a, it's a lifelong pursuit of taking it to the hoop. Because for those of who, you know, people who play basketball or know the game, if you're driving the basketball and you're driving to the hoop, well, it means you're, you know, you're focused on scoring, you've got a goal, you're, you're being aggressive, you're playing offense, not to, all these things that, you know, it's pretty simple for those of us who've been in the business world for a while to see the analogies, but uh, take it to the hoop as a kid meant get closer, Allison, because you're not that good. So maybe if you got closer, you might make it. Uh, but take it to the hoop has really been a constant drumbeat in my mind around a strategy of uh, to drive to success. And I think, again, when we talk a little bit more about your career, it seems to me you've taken it to the hoop a number of times. Um, I do think, though, our listeners probably don't fully grasp, and I've only gotten to, um, to learn this myself in our relationship with the Girl Scouts and the Fever and, and some of the things you've tried to do to gather people, community leaders together to think about how can the Fever be the community's team and what does that mean? So my question to you is, talk to our listeners a little bit about it is it's basketball and it's a sport but it is so much more than that what are some of the um exciting ways that you've tried to really make the fever be a household name Mm -hmm. um, or maybe some of the more innovative projects that you're working on with the fever and its platform um, that that you believe are important for whether it's youth or our community or the sport. And I know that's a really broad question, but again, I, I want people to expand their thinking about the fever basketball franchise because basketball is important, but but it's really a whole lot more than that. Yeah, that's, that's such an interesting question. It, you know, when I was offered this position uh, I did some just, you know, like anybody does, you're going into a new job and you try to think about what, you know, what can you do? What, you, you know, what can you put your hand to that might shape the direction or, I mean, the goal is in every career that, you know, you're additive, like you bring something good and new, you know, if it was you know, CEO of status quo, that would be a pretty boring <laughs> position and, and a waste of time. So when I you know, landed in this role and met with Tamika and we just, we, you know, we just kind of kept kicking around the idea of what is it that we stand for? What needle do we want to move? You know, it's, it's not any different than other leaders and business owners, but we put together a strategy. We knew we wanted to create a championship culture. Uh, in, in the, the words I'm using, I, I hope it are coming across clearly that I'm not saying win a championship, although we want to and we will win a championship too. But first and foremost, we wanted to create this championship culture. And we thought, well, what does it take to get to a championship culture? And so, you know, Danielle, to your question, we designed a three-pronged strategy that is commit, compete, and contribute. And, and that is really, if the commitment is how do we commit to being the best people we can be every day? How do we commit to each other? That means we have honest conversations. We're, you know, we're always learning and growing. I mean, it's a real transparent relationship within the Fever franchise of this commitment to excellence. And it starts with each of us. And then compete, of course, is how do we win games? You know, how do we win the best partners? How do we win fandom? That's the compete piece of that. And then the third piece is the contribute. And I think that gets a little bit to your, the question you're asking me, which I love is like, how do you take this amazing game? You know, I used to say and make a contribution in the community. So the C is how do we contribute back into our community statewide, not just Indianapolis, but statewide. And as recently as last week, you know, I, changed my own, the words that I use. Cause I used to say, when I took this job, I'm like, I'm taking this job cause I want to figure out how do you use the platform of basketball to change the world? I've said that March will be two years uh, that I've been in this job. But just last week I said to Tamika, I want to change my wording that it's, how do we use the scheme of basketball to improve this world? And the, the distinction is important because I want it to represent that the people who have come before us, so you think about our owners, the people who started the franchise, like all of the folks that got us to the point that we can celebrate that the WNBA is 25 seasons old, that the Fever is 21 seasons old. 
they believed in these things too, of like using this game to inspire and motivate. And so for us, we've said that let's, let's continue to improve. We don't need to change. We're on the right trajectory. We just need to improve at every opportunity. This summer, big opportunity around social justice. So we had launched uh, new fundraising campaigns. Our players auctioned off their shoes. We're donating money to local nonprofits that are working on issues that provide girls opportunity and inclusion and diversity. And so it really is, Daniel, about seeing this great group of athletes in this franchise that believes in improving society and then finding the right touch points that align with who we are and who our players are. Is, is the platform defined, in your opinion, by the organization or by the players on the team at the time? How important is it that they are passionate about, um, I guess, the needs or the work they're doing in the community? Yeah, the vision is, the vision is created by the franchise. The execution of the vision is adapted to the desires and the passion of our players. Um, and so, you know, last, also, I, I learned so much in this job. It's really a ton of fun. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, they used to say to our players when we would draft players, they had a little spreadsheet and they said, I think this was so interesting to me. Um, what are you interested in? What are you interested in? Because the idea is, oh, we'll see what you're interested in. And then we'll connect you with that opportunity in the community. Last year, we said to our players, you know, what if you were a force for good? What would you want to be a force for? What was fascinating to me is almost without exception, the answer to what do you want to be a force for was different than what are you interested in? Mm -hmm. So I had a player that was interested in cooking. I said, what do you want to be a force for? She said, oh, I want to be a force for foster care. But that taught me like words really do have meaning, don't they? Mm -hmm. And so our vision is commit, compete, and contribute. Every player on the fever, you won't even want to come to our franchise if you're not a person who wants to really roll your sleeves up and engage and, you know, contribute to the community because that's equally important to us. But how you contribute will be designed around where our, the play, where our players want to have a forceful influence. So I wanna um, pick up on something you said. Um, I think it's fascinating as I've again, learned a little bit about the franchise and things I didn't understand in terms of the inequities in female basketball um, versus their peers. Mm -hmm. And you've worked really hard, um, or at least it seems to me that Indiana and the, the Pacers and the FIBA organization and all the leaders within it have worked hard to kind of create this platform for bringing equity to the WNBA and to the players in the in the front and our team, tell talk about the successes there. Um, what work still needs to be done, um, and and really just kind of how our like you mentioned, many of our many of our players right now are playing overseas. I think again, our listeners may not understand the, these nuances, which I think are so important to the story, um, and frankly made me a different kind of fan. So I, if you share a little bit about that, if you don't mind, sure. But the WNBA and the NBA or other male sports are they're really a different, it's a very different model. And so, you know, you think about in the WNBA, our players have to go to four years of college before they can enter the draft. So the majority of them already have a college degree, where in the men, they have to go one year of college before they can go to the draft. Some of that design, I think, is because the understanding that the pay scale for women is so different than men's in WNBA versus the NBA. Uh, and so what you find is that for women, the, well, they'll play in our season. For the WNBA season runs from May to October when you make the playoffs and go through the full season. As soon as the, the, the day our season ends, our players pack their bags, the majority of them pack their bags, and the next day they're on a plane overseas to play in the overseas um, market because that's how they augment their salary. And so, uh, and they're playing, I have seven of my players right now are overseas and Turkey and Israel and France and Russia and China and Japan. I mean, these are the countries that they go to to play. 
So what happens with that is that it's it's good because they augment their salary and they fine tune some of their skills, but it's physically really difficult. Um, and so we find that the average WNBA player plays for three and a half three and a half years. That's it. So you compare that to what you typically know would be true about men's sports. Very very different model. Our focus then is how do we develop our players? So we're, we play in the summer. Uh, you know how do we attract fans and and partners around the work that we're doing together? How do we build into our players? And then how do we provide learning opportunities for them? So when their season is over or when they finish playing, there's additional job opportunities. And so, you know, we're always talking, we're talking with companies around internships for our players and really finding out how do we help develop, give our players opportunities to develop. So they're very marketable to degrees uh, outside of playing this game that they love because it's a short career for the majority of them. Yeah, I think it's, again, I think that that's something I had no idea. And I think it's fascinating some of the work that's been done to try to um, narrow some of the gaps. Mm -hmm. But I would say, again, outside or looking in, there's a lot of work still to be done so that our female players maybe don't have to, um, to do what you just described and can make um, a career out of playing for the WNBA alone. Is that, is that possible? I, you know, I don't know. I don't know if it is possible because it's a business model that says, you know, you have to bring in the right partners. You have to bring in the right ticket sale, amount of ticket sales. You know, I mean, there, there is an economics to it. I do think that we've leveled some of the playing field and our new commissioner has done great work. We're fortunate in Indiana because of the Simons who own Pacer Sports and Entertainment. Like we are so fortunate because their focus really is on doing everything we can to give our the fever equal and terrific opportunities as they do for the pacer so we're we're making great strides uh, but the economics of it have to work nationally uh, for the women's team equal to other women's teams or other men's teams yeah unfortunately there's a lot of follow the dollars right it has to be a good business plan as well yes. so I, you you mentioned um you learned something you you know you read on a spreadsheet and so I want to give a little bit of your bio to our listeners and please forgive me if I make errors, but you've, you truly have, have, have had very different careers, starting with first grade teacher, mm -hmm. um, to leading um, a major not-for-profit, to your own company, to working as the deputy assistant secretary of defense um, in communications, if I, if I understand that correctly, um, chancellor uh, in higher ed. And so in each of these jobs, um, you had to learn different skill sets. So, you know, I read an article where you talked about competency-based education when you were the chancellor. Um, and then, you know, you had to write a comms plan for missiles when you took the first, you know, the job at the Department of Defense. Some people might think that's impossible to learn all this new knowledge. And then you had to learn basketball, maybe in a different way you've ever understood basketball before. Talk about how you go about staying on top of your game, regardless of the hat you're wearing, but also what has been the thread? What's been the one thing that's kind of been your North Star in every one of these jobs that's made the new learning a little bit easier because you've always maintained this core, core way of work, core way of thinking, core way of, I, I, except broad question, mm -hmm. uh, but again, I, I hope it made sense. Well, it did, make, it did make sense. The only thing that doesn't make sense probably is my career trajectory. Um, <laughs> so I would say, there, so there are a few things. I mean, it, the, having eight careers, not jobs, but careers works if you're a person who really loves disruption, and I do, and somebody who loves change because it keeps me energized you know, it, but it takes all sorts of people. You know, you also need people. When I worked at the Pentagon, there were people that worked at the Pentagon for 30 years and you need continuity, you know, so it takes all types. So I would never prescribe that my way is the best way. It just suits me perfectly. Um, but, but you have to be willing to jump in. You know, I like to jump into the deep end. I always have in life. It's like, just jump in because I'll swim or sink. But I mean, it's, you'll fight harder to swim than, you know, let yourself sink. 
So in jumping into the deep end and taking new, on new careers, what you do right away is you say, okay, what is common and what is similar? Because that's the safe place. It's, I, I talk a lot about how the brain always tries to solve the easiest problems first. So, oh, you get offered a new job and what's your brain say? Your brain says, oh, I wonder if I get parking. Like that is the, that is the dumbest question. Like, do I get parking? Like, but you can't help it because your brain wants to solve the simple first because then they, you can clear out the simple and now focus on the complicated. But so when I change new careers, I typically look at, okay, what is the simple and what do I know to be true uh, that I build on these competencies? And so I do be, really do believe in competency-based learning and life that everything you do, it's my take it to the hoop mentality. The more you take it to the hoop, the more confident you are the more confident you are in the layup, then now you can pull back and shoot from 10 feet away and you'll build that competency. So I think that's what I've tried to do in each career is just, you know, what did I do before? And how do I apply that to this while I have to free up my brain to now learn new content? Um, but the, you know, I'm, you're exactly right. My first week on the job at the Pentagon you know, my boss said, oh, go talk to this general because we need a communication plan around missile defense. So, I mean, I barely could figure out where his office was in the Pentagon. That's how new I was. And, but, but if you're willing to ask questions, if you're willing to listen, if you're willing to bring in other experts, then you find your place and you let people, fortunately, if you're as fortunate as I am, I've had a ton of people help me uh, develop and grow in these new careers. But the thread for me, Daniel, I guess, I, you know, the thread is really um, my, if I had one word that would, that I've tried to live into, not, and not always well, but the thread is contribution. So in every one of my careers, uh, I wouldn't take a job, I wouldn't take a mo career move if I couldn't figure out how that job was contributing to something I believed in. And so... I've been really fortunate, you know, like you said, teaching school, so obvious American, you know, all the nonprofit work, all of the spaces that I've been in, it's pretty easy to say, oh, no wonder she's in that role because they can contribute to this mission. And so I think that's what drives me. And I work hard to, I, I, I hope I, you know, I hope I deserve it because I hope I deserve these opportunities because I want to make sure that everything I put my hand to, I'm like you too, Danielle. It's like if we're not helping someone else, um, then what's you know what's going to fall short and and seem shallow. So again, if someone were, were looking at your career trajectory, mm -hmm. a lot of it, I'm going to say, makes sense. Like you can see how this built upon this built upon this, but the very first step from first grade to Washington D.C. may not make. So like, how did you go from first grade teacher? Mm -hmm. um, to kind of that next first step, which I think probably would be the, in my opinion, the greatest leap, if you will. Yeah, I think that, I think it was, I, that's a really good point. Uh, and because I was, I taught school for six years, I had a master's in education. And so typically once you're set up in that way, people expect you will always be a school teacher, which is a great career. Uh, but I was ready for something different and I didn't know what it would be. And so my husband uh, was a practicing attorney. The first Gulf War broke out and he came home and he said, I really want to serve the country. And so I was all for it. He quit his job, Notre Dame alum, practicing attorney. He quit his job. I quit my job. He joined the army and we moved to our first assignment was in Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. So I liked it because it was about 42 minutes from New York City, my favorite place in the world. And so there we were in New Jersey. I did not know what I wanted to do, but I gave myself seven weeks. And I honestly, I'm just, a, I'm kind of a simple person. I was like, oh, there, I've got this $700 in this little like, you know, slush fund over here, my little secret fund. I have $700. I'll give myself a budget of $100 a week, which means I have seven weeks by the, by the seventh week, I have to have a job. Uh, this is all self-imposed, believe me, my husband is not this restrictive at all or, or strategic about our, you know, what I need or don't need to do. <laughs> this is just me being me. So I decided I didn't know what I wanted to do. And nobody would, you know, no matter what I applied for, I was like, oh, you're a teacher. So that didn't work. So I thought, oh, well, I'm going to take every job interview I can get, 
maybe I'll be able to figure out what I don't want to do. So I had over 50 job interviews, door to door encyclopedia sales. That dates when this happened, that people were going door to door to sell encyclopedias pre Google, uh, car sales. Went into uh, New York, applied for a job at a temp agency. I, you know, this is a, I'll come back to that story in just a second. Um, it, acting in TV commercials, you know, they thought, oh, sure. Oh, they said to me, oh, my word, you'd be great in commercials. We think you've got a future in TV. And, you know, but just sign up for this acting class for $300 and you'll be good to go. It's like, okay. Uh, but it was fascinating. So I did all of these job interviews and it helped me really identify what didn't feel like the right place to contribute. Um, and, and when I went into this temp agency in New York, it's fascinating to me. I went in, I met with this woman, this is a temp agency, and I met with this woman and she was, she probably been working in the agency for a hundred years. It's back in the day when you could smoke in an office, you could barely see because the, you know, like the smoke was so thick and this woman with a raspy voice smoking her cigarette. And she said to me, I don't even know why you're here. You don't have the, you don't really have the talent to do anything. And I got on the train and uh, headed to head back. And I remember feeling so deflated, like kind of, you know, head against the window of the plane, like, oh my word, I'm not talented to do anything. And on that ride home, I thought, why am I letting this woman who works at a temp agency, who I don't know, who doesn't know me, but for that sheet of paper, why am I letting her have a, a voice in my head that is making me doubt myself? Like, I mean, but it was a real moment for me of saying, gosh, that's, you know, the power of words. And that's why it's so important to make sure you have the right kind of people around you in life, because it didn't take much for her. To, you know, I didn't push back and say, oh, I've got a master's degree. I taught school for six years. Like I was with her. I was believing what she was, you know, handing out that I didn't have the talent to do anything. Um, so I kind of had to regroup after that conversation with her. And I started volunteering uh, for a local nonprofit, which had an office in Washington, DC. And so they offered me a full-time job at the nonprofit, I moved, my husband transferred with the army. We went to DC and spent 20 years there. And so it was really my, I mean, this is really what's so true. My volunteer work, my husband wanting to serve the country changed our geography. My volunteer work changed my trajectory and I'm really grateful. So what was that, what was the agency? If, so that kind of was your your pivot point was with the Red, was it the Red Cross? American Red Cross, yeah. Okay. yeah. And it was interesting when I was teaching school in North, I think it was interesting, um, but because I still can't believe it. I was teaching school in Northwest Indiana. And in the summers I worked at a country club. I was in charge of, I was a, a Red Cross lifeguard. And so I ran the pool and tennis as a teacher so I could augment that huge rocking $16,000 a year salary. Um, and one day I was clocking in and on the wall next to the time clock is the big banner with the Department of Labor has to publish all the rules for employment and signed at the bottom was the Secretary of Labor, Elizabeth Dole. And when I clocked in, I looked at that signature and I said, someday I'm going to work for her. <laughs> someday I'm going to work for her. Fast forward. I'm in Northwest Indiana. I'm going to work for Elizabeth Dole, who's the Department of Labor Secretary. Fast forward. Now I'm all of the things we just talked about, the military, volunteering. Now I'm at Red Cross working at National Headquarters. And who's the president of the Red Cross at the time? Elizabeth Dole. So it was really magical. And and you still you still serve on, on, the, on the Elizabeth Dole Foundation. Is that right? I do. Yes. Just uh, about 10 years ago, Elizabeth decided to start a nonprofit for military caregivers because her husband, Senator Bob Dole, was at Walter Reed for medical care for 11 months. I think that's right. And she would go every day and she'd tell all these families that were trying to meet the needs of their wounded warrior. And uh, she realized they didn't have resources. People didn't even know who they were. So she wanted to start a foundation and invited me to help her. And so we've been at it. Uh, she's done amazing work. It's an inspiration to me. Elizabeth, you know, two-time cabinet secretary, senator from North Carolina, candidate for president, you know, exploratory run for president. And in her 70s, still so, um, you know, capable and competent and had the capacity to say, there's a need and I'm going to put my hand to it and start a new foundation. It's fascinating to me because uh, Ethel Aunt Percy Andrus was also in her 70s. Yeah. 
when she started um, the National Teachers Retirement Fund, which later became AARP. So like the, it, that motivates the heck out of me because I'm like, oh man, look at what these women are doing in their 70s. Let's go. We got a, more to do. <laughs> I was just I was just thinking about our, our ages collectively or separately and thinking, gosh, we still have a lot more time to do great things. Let's do it. That's that's, that's do what it. that's what I walk away thinking. Yes. No, the the part about the the temp agency and your point about words and people um, and how important that could be actually made me think. Um, I think you know my background is in teaching as well about children and how young minds are so sponges and they hear things like that and and how careful as adults we have to be to say to say the right words that are encouraging and um and so then my mind went to i wonder who who were those people when you look back on your you know your path to today um you mentioned elizabeth dole but you know are there one or two that you think this person they're they're in my head they shaped me um and, and, yeah and and what did they teach you there are several. Uh, my mom is a school teacher as well. So that is um, probably the, the longest, you know, <laughs> voice in my head. And my mom is really, as an educator, of course, motivated to help people and care for people. And, you know, my mom taught me to see people. So I remember as a kid, this is not a very complimentary story to me at all. But I remember as a kid, we'd be at church and there was a person, a young high school kid that would always want to come up and say hi to my mom. And, you know, the truth is the kid was kind of different, annoying, different, whatever. And I just, oh, I'd see that kid coming on and be like, oh my Lord, my mom's going to talk to him. And it just would irritate me that she would give him time because I just wanted to get to the car and get him and watch football on Sunday afternoon. But even in that moment, I remember thinking that the reason that kid comes over and talks to my mom is because she sees him and respects him. And I think from my mom, I learned that important lesson of, you know, just respecting people, no matter who they are or what they bring to the table and to see people for who they are. And so I hope that I have I think that's a lesson you have to keep learning. You know, it's not a one time done, but that, you know, of all the things my mom influenced me in, that's probably one of the, the best influences I've had is just try to see people. And I think that's really come to um, help me over the past year with all of the social issues and social justice issues of challenging myself of how do I see people and, and how do I treat people with respect? That, I mean, that is a daily challenge. So I appreciate that with my mom. Um, but I've been really surrounded by so many wonderful leaders, whether they were politicians, you know, or Sunday school teachers. I mean, it's just, it's, you know, one time somebody said to me, oh, the best thing somebody can do with you is share, share their reputation and their Rolodex, share their reputation and their Rolodex. And um, when I came to, back to Indiana, my husband, and I lived in DC for 20 years and I came back to Indiana to start WGU Indiana, Mitch Daniels wanted to start this new non-profit online university and asked me to do it, to be the chancellor. You know, Daniel, I moved here. I didn't know anybody in Indianapolis other than my parents, my family. And in my first year, I met with 218 people. In my first 365 days, I met with 218 people. Then that's first time meeting. So if you and I met for coffee, I, and we met three months later, I didn't count that twice. Like, so I, I mean, you talk about people that have shaped me and influenced me. That taught me in a minute that like Hoosiers and people here in Indiana care for the, for you to be the best you can be. I wouldn't say that was always true in, in DC. You know, that would have, that would not have been the, the culture necessarily in DC. So there are just so many people that have given me that opportunity of you know, and you've done it for me too, Daniel, you, you and I would meet and you'd be like, oh, you should talk to so-and-so. It's that pass it on mentality. And so I'm inspired by and motivated by so many people here in our own city and state that have just demonstrated the way of what it really looks like to be collaborative and supportive. And uh, I've benefited from that. No, I cannot agree more. Our community is, I'd, I'd like to think that's all across the country and around the world, but I do think it's pretty special here. And, uh, and you had great success at WGU from 250 students to 5,000. I mean, you 
you achieved. So I'm gonna, I have to kick it back to Robert here, um, but uh, he's gonna probably take it a little different direction. So I'll chime in if there's something, uh, something wise that I might wanna say or do, but Robert. You're listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmond Construction, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. Our guest today is Allison Barber, President and Chief Operating Officer of the Indiana Fever, our co-host today who just did a bang-up job, as always, Girl Scouts Central Indiana CEO, Danielle Shockey. Allison, it's great to talk to you. As I joked earlier, I've actually, I don't think I've ever met you unless I was trailing behind Greg Ballard at some point and you all were having a conversation. Is there a Hoosier leader and or legend you particularly admire? Oh, wow. Now that is a, that's a tough question. <laughs> um, I, boy, that list is long. That, but the first person that comes to mind when you said that is Teresa Lovers who is the commissioner of, uh, commissioner for higher ed. And uh, boy, I hate to pick out, I mean, I don't mind picking out Teresa at all, uh, but there are so many Hoosiers that have done great work. But what I, what I appreciate about Teresa is she has just got a ability to look across the horizon and see uh, needs and, and solutions to solve, you know, to meet the need. And she can look across many industries and probably because of her background and she worked for, you know, Senator Luger, everybody was mayor, I think she worked for him, campaign forum. So she's got a little Luger-esque in her. She's, uh, was a, the, you know, she worked in state legislature. So uh, when I look at Teresa, I just think, wow, she's got this capacity to really go across all of these different, you know, platforms and look for, and see problems and find solutions. And I just, I admire the heck out of her. You will be excited to know that Senator Lubbers has agreed to come on the podcast to be interviewed by uh, Danielle and me. We'll record that here in a few weeks. So uh, I hope you will listen. I will. She's terrific. But isn't it great? Isn't it great that when you ask me that question, it's like, oh my word, by the names, just like I could, I probably could give you 50 people right now of Hoosiers who are great role models and leaders because that's, I mean, we're really blessed here. May I, may I say that I'm I'm somewhat shocked that you didn't mention that your answer didn't include Jim Morris because Jim Morris is probably the most his name is given a, to the answer to that question probably more than anyone else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought about Jim. I thought about his wife Jackie. I mean, that's the thing. It's like where do you end? Sue Elsperman, Elaine Beadle, Governor Holcomb, Mitch Daniels. I mean, what a like, I, I hope what people walk away from in this moment right now of going, we are so blessed in Indiana that we have leaders with integrity and this world needs more people like the ones we've just named. I, I feel somewhat validated because every name you've mentioned, they've appeared on this podcast and we're very <laughs> grateful. We're very grateful to the, the folks who give of their time to, of course, they're talking a little bit about themselves, but a lot of them are talking about their lives and their causes and their careers and that's what this podcast is all about. Speaking of a leader and a legend, what's it like to be around Tamika Catchings? You know, Tamika is one of a kind and she is what, what you see is exactly who she is. And I, every day people will say, oh, you're in sports. What's the best part about being in sports? And I honestly say working with Tamika is the highlight of um, you know, my job every day because she brings intentionality and focus, uh, winsomeness, uh, passion to the job, and she has excelled at every level. You don't find a lot of people like that, and I'm thrilled, and our state is so fortunate that Tamika has invested her, you know, her life here and plans to stay here. We're really, it's wonderful. You earned a PhD. Tennessee Temple University, if I have that correct. Yes. It was a few months ago at the time of this recording that there was a bit of a dust up about Dr. Jill Biden and her, I believe her doctorate's in education and whether she had earned the title of Dr. 
it, it was a very sort of ill-timed, ill-considered piece from my standpoint. But I, I'm, I'm a bit of a monarchist. I still call all of my professors a doctor, all of them, as a matter of fact. Um, what was your take on that? I thought it was a colossal waste of time. Um, I, I think if somebody used a title they hadn't earned, well, then maybe we would want to explore the legitimacy of that. The fact that Dr. Biden earned her doctorate is a legitimate title for her to use. So I just thought it was really more of a, a sign of the time where sadly people are a little you know, more focused on what they disagree with and what they agree with. And I think that is a exercise in frustration and just a useless, you know, <laughs> pursuit. When Danielle is on the podcast, especially, but not just when she is on the podcast, we talk about and, and kind of use the phrase in a fun way, but what with good intent, uh, girl power and what does that what does that word mean to you? Uh, it really just it means equal opportunity to succeed. You know, girl power. It just means you you should have the opportunity to have a dream and go for it and have the chance to be successful at what it is you dream about doing. And so, girl power is. I'm. I'm a little bit old school. I want boys to have boy power and I want girls to have girl power. I don't want one to have more than the other. I want it to be equal because I think that's how we work the best as a community is that everybody can be the best at who they should be. And that way we recognize and celebrate diversity and, and differences. Has been mentioned on the podcast uh, more than once for better or worse, I was in the army from 87 to 90. Go army. Go army. <laughs> we hope Governor Holcomb isn't listening with his with his go Navy bumper sticker <laughs> on his car. It's the um, best Navy we have. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I often say it's the best decision I've ever made. If you could speak for your husband, would he just say the same other than marrying... Allison Barber. Yeah, if I could speak for my husband, I would. Um, joining the military, I think, definitely was the. It, it was one of the best decisions he's ever made. I tell you what really uh, moved him was when he volunteered and went to a uh, volunteer to go to Iraq. So he spent a year in Iraq. And he will tell you that that was the highlight of his military career in that. He had the opportunity to work side by side with these young men and women who, you know, such as yourself, volunteer to serve and to see their dedication and their uh, commitment uh, to do what was right in the military for the good of the world at the time uh, was inspiring to him. And it's, um, you know, that service is something that he holds dearly and we both do, you know, I have so much admiration for him for serving and to all of our veterans who, you know, what a blessing in our country that people raise their hand and volunteer to serve this nation. And I'm very grateful. My son, Joshua was one of the um, Americans, young Americans uh, who volunteered uh, for the military after 9-11, mm -hmm. of which there have been millions. And I find that to be a particularly special group of people. As much as millennials get uh, punked out a little bit um, without completely taking their side on some things, I do find that to be an, an oft omitted uh, characteristic of the millennial generation. Uh, my son ended up doing uh, two tours in Afghanistan as a combat infantryman. And you're right. You are exactly right in the sense it's, it's a specialness because you don't have to, and yet you do it anyway. And I felt as much as anything, as much as I was worried about him, I felt a special kinship to his wonderful wife uh, who remained in the United States as he went to Afghanistan twice. What's it like to be that wife? 
Well, you're, you know, when your spouse is deployed, um, you know, for Lyndon and me, I do be, to be completely transparent, it was, you know, we didn't have children. It wasn't as hard for us as it is for so many spouses who have to raise kids and deal with everything on their own. And so I'm very uh, cautious when I talk about what that kind of life is like when your loved one deploys. Uh, we were fortunate, you know, we had the, the, when he deployed the first time to Korea for a year, it was difficult. It was before email. We could only talk once a week. It was incredibly expensive. Years later, when he deployed to Iraq, not only could we email, I happened to be working at the Pentagon. I could call him at his desk in Iraq. So I, I'm saying that is his sacrifice was real and you know his base was bombed. Like the risk was real, but no one should ever think that my husband and I had to deal with some of the difficulties that so many of our men and women have to deal with when it comes to that challenge of deployment and raising children and um, not being able to be in com communication. I mean, it's it's something special what our men and women and especially in the enlisted ranks make uh, for this country. I have to tell you though, on 9-11, I, I flew that morning. When you told me about your son, I was so inspired. I flew that morning of 9-11 to Atlanta to meet with an ad agency. The purpose of the ad pitch was they were help coming up with an ad campaign that the Department of Defense would use to help inspire and motivate people to serve in the military. Now think about this. I'm sitting in this meeting. When I arrived at the ad agency, they told me about the attack on the country. And that's why we're in Atlanta. I rented a car, drove back. The, that's a different story. But the point is, after 9-11 happened, we were so, um, kids like your son, they didn't need an ad campaign. They saw our country was under attack and they raised their hand to defend and protect our country. We never did that ad campaign because of kids like your son. So you thank him for me, but know that that is a special, that 9-11 generation is a special group of military members who just saw the need and met the need. And it's really touches my heart. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, it's one thing like I did to, to be in the military and to come from a military family um, on Veterans Day, I, I counted up and if the, uh, the generation below mine and the generation above mine, if you add them up, in my family, there are 15. Mm, that's great. People who served, uh, including my niece who was in Afghanistan and is now at the National Guard. Her name's Katie Elkins, who you may have actually met because she worked in the public affairs office. Uh, but, but to volunteer after an attack like 9-11, to know that your chances of being shot at or in combat are exponentially greater. I agree with you. That is a special, special generation. You actually anticipated my next question because I was going to ask you, where were you on 9-11? And you were in Atlanta, but you could have been at the Pentagon. Yes, yes. Um... I was working at the Pentagon from May prior to that. And so, yes, that morning I got up early and flew to Atlanta um, for the ad pitch. And it was interesting because um, when we got in the building, the receptionist was so frantic almost. And I said, what's happened? She goes, oh, the World Trade Towers have been hit by a plane. And I said, can, I, can you get me to a TV? And we're at this major, humongous, major successful ad agency and they ran me into a conference room and there's a man watching a tv and it was one of those small little televisions that had a radio attached to it and like your grandmother probably had it on a microwave <laughs> and it was just like the irony of being in this ad agency and this man watching the small tv and i couldn't even see the screen because it was so small so i had to peek over his shoulder and then i saw the pentagon was on fire and i said that's not the world trade towers he said no a plane just crashed into the pentagon so I immediately got to a phone and uh, tried to call my husband who worked across the street. So he actually saw the explosion of the plane into the Pentagon and all the phone lines were down. And so then I called my parents, my mom who lived in Indiana, lives in Indiana. And I called her and I just said, mom, I just want to let you know, I'm not at the Pentagon today. And she said, okay. I said, you know, that was a short conversation, but I just wanted to let her know. My husband walked 
two miles from his office to get to a phone. And when he got to the phone, he called my parents to let them know I wasn't at the Pentagon. So when my mom answered and he's like, mom, I just want to let you know, you know, Allie's not at the Pentagon today. And she said, oh, I know I've already talked to her. And it was years later when I heard my husband telling somebody that story that he said, you know, that was the first time I knew Allie was a safe was because of I had talked to my mom. Oh, that's a great point. That interesting? So he was so calm when he said to my mom, oh, she's not here, but he didn't know where I was. He didn't know what plane I was in, what was happening, but it was just, you know, nothing but the facts. I'm not in the Pentagon. And so that was in interesting. Um, but anyway, I tried to get back to DC. We, all the planes were landed, so grounded and all, nobody was returning their rental cars to the airport. So I got an old phone book. You remember those things, the phone book? Um, <laughs> Look through the page called Every Car Agency, Rental Agency in the downtown Atlanta area. I found budget rental car. They had one passenger van, 15 passenger van. They rented it to me. I was able to take my colleagues that were traveling with me and we, we drove and got back to the Pentagon the next day, uh, right before President Bush came to review the crash site and meet with the first responder. So it was, you know, it was surreal. Uh, it was a, just, you know, surreal. May I ask if you knew of anyone who was injured that day at the Pentagon? Our mm -hmm. friend Kevin Kellum's working there, and I've known Kevin for a long time through politics, and he has some interesting, interesting stories and recollections. I knew of General Maude, who was from Indiana, the highest ranking uh, person to die that day. Um, he was in the, in the Pentagon. I met families after the fact. Part of my job at the Pentagon um, was community relations. So every day from 9-11 forward, I would go over to the hotel where the families were waiting to get news about their loved ones or, you know, just any update. So I got to know a lot of the families. And to this day, I'm still very good friends with some of the families who, you know, suffered that tragic loss that day. Sticking with the Pentagon, but perhaps in a, in a, in a more upbeat fashion, I've been there I don't know, half dozen or 10 times and find it a particularly inspiring place to be. What was it like working at the Pentagon um, and seeing all those people in uniform all day and night long, every single day of the year? It's absolutely, I think it's a beautiful sight. I would only speak for myself. What about you? You. Uh, yes, I agree with you. It is the Pentagon is a perfect blend of patriotism and force of uh, commitment and intimidation. <laughs> uh, the you know the generals, a one-star general is you know if you're out on a military base, if you're a captain, you're running the show. If, the, if you're a captain at the Pentagon, you're getting the general's coffee. I mean, it's just this amazing <laughs> you know environment of smart and dedicated and committed people. The, I loved the intensity of the Pentagon. Um, Secretary Rumsfeld used to say, hey, you know, we're, we're it's a marathon, not a sprint. And, you know, we would joke and say, yeah, but you want us to run our marathon at a sprinter's pace. And, and you would want that from people who have signed on to defend this country, you know? And so that intensity of every detail mattered. Um, you had to get it right. It was... It was a inspiring and it was electric and it just motivated you to, to bring more to the game every single day because the people around you were doing the same thing. You are listening to the Leaders and Legends podcast. Our guest is Allison Barber, President and Chief Operating Officer of the Indiana Fever. Our co-host is Danielle Shockey. I'm about ready to turn it back over to Danielle so she can ask you the five questions. But I would be remiss in omitting asking you what it was like to be around Donald Rumsfeld. Again, you have anticipated <laughs> my question. Uh, I loved working for Secretary Rumsfeld. He was uh, smart and funny and uh, driven. And he really, you know, it's one of those things. I, I felt like Elizabeth Dole was the same way. I mean, I've had this great pleasure to work around people that just demanded excellence. And so sometimes it was your worst nightmare. <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, you just felt great because they pushed you to, to be the best that you could be. 
um, and in both Secretary Rumsfeld and also Elizabeth Dole, you, you, you know, you could never outwork them. And so when people demand a lot from you, it's hard, but the fact that they demand that much from themselves and then more is inspiring. One of the reasons I started this podcast, uh, well, Rachel Coverdale from Coverdale Consulting is the reason I started this podcast, but is to be able to talk to people who have made a difference, are making a difference, have chronicled difference makers. And through some of the conversations I've had, my guests and I and, and Danielle have been able to talk to terrific leaders about leadership. To me, I've made the point in other podcasts, I think it's the most underrated aspect of success. And maybe that's because I'm a history nut and love to read about uh, inspiring leaders. Who are some of the best leaders you've been around? I, I know you mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, Teresa Lubbers, but your career, you have just been in the presence of men and women who have assumed and executed, assumed great responsibility and executed at the highest level. How does that help you as chief operating officer of the Indiana Fever? Uh, well, you're right. I have been around a lot of amazing people, only a handful of whom I would declare as leaders. So many of them were bosses. Many of them had big titles. Not many of them were what I would define as actual leaders. And so I think that, you know, in my mind, leadership, when I talk about, there's that ER, ER factor is a real thing. So a lot of people can lead, but not everybody can be a leader. Like I, get, I golf, but I'm not a golfer. I run, but I'm not a runner. Like ERs matter in life. And so unless you're going to commit hours and hours to the pursuit of leadership every day, if you're a professional golfer, a professional basketball player, you are practicing every day. So for me, if you're going to assume the mantle of leader and leadership, it means the ER factor means that you work at being a leader every day. So I would say there, you know, there've been a handful of those folks that I think pursue it in that way. Um, and it's, but it's a pursuit every day and it's hard. And they're intentional about leadership and understand the responsibility that comes with it. And the fact that they either implicitly or explicitly know and demonstrate that they're training the future generation of leaders. That's, yes, that's right. Leadership is influence. You know, I think that's John Maxwell's shortest definition of it. it's inf how are you influencing that other people to lead <clears throat> people and um, that it's a big responsibility for sure. Danielle, are you ready and aimed and armed with the five questions or do you want to ask Allison something else before you get to that? I think I'm ready. So Allison, we asked the same five questions of all of our guests. They're okay. rapid fire. So just relax. No. What was your what was your very first job? Selling uh, seed packets door to door. I was in uh, fourth grade. I wanted to make enough money to buy a used car. It was twelve hundred dollars. Didn't dawn on me that if I could buy it, I couldn't drive it. But I ordered seed packets from Bazooka and went door to door selling seeds. Oh my gosh! Which this is not one of the five questions. Side story: Did you ever sell Girl Scout? Were you a Girl Scout? It wasn't. We didn't have Girl Scouts at my my community, my school. Okay, because you could have been a top Girl Scout seller, I bet. Okay. Second question: What was your first concert? Uh, first concert was, I don't know that I've been to a real concert as a kid. I think it was maybe Johnny Mathis. Isn't that terrible? <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> Fire me. Fire, it was going to be either Barry Mantle or Johnny Mathis. And my repertoire is not that interesting, but I've never even been to a rock concert. <laughs> oh, there's a, there's a thing we need to do with Robert. We'll take Allison to a concert someday. Robert is quite the new, the music connoisseur. Third question, what is one book that you think you'd recommend to others to read? Oh, I just read The Gratitude Diary. It's terrific. It just totally 
awesome book about the power of gratitude. So the gratitude diaries, it's even a good audio book. The author reads it and you feel like you're just having coffee with a good friend listening to it. Awesome. Okay. If you could witness one moment in history as it happened, be there, what would you want to see? Past one minute in history. Ooh. I'm not going to go very far back. Oh, that's a good one. I'm not going to go very far back. I would have loved to have been at the speech where Ronald Reagan told Gorbachev to tear down that wall. Excellent choice. And he did it despite the fact that most of his advisors told him not to say it. That's exactly right. The speech writer told me that story too. Like they, everybody said it's too, I thought this line was so interesting. His chief of staff said it's too optimistic to be presidential. Too optimistic to be presidential. Isn't that interesting? That would make a great book title. Uh -huh. no, wonder, no wonder Nancy Reagan didn't like Mr. Uh, Donald yep. Reagan. Yep. <laughs> All right, the fifth question. If you could have two hours off the record, dinner, lunch with somebody a li living today, who would you want to sit down with? Oprah. That's a great answer. One I do not believe we've had. Yeah. Yeah, I think she's fascinating on every, you know, every level of her success and career and the influence and impact she makes in this world. I think it'd be interesting. You have been listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmond Construction, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. Our guest today has been Dr. Allison Barber, President and Chief Operating Officer of the Indiana Fever. Our co-host has been Danielle Shockey, CEO, Girl Scouts of Central Indiana. Thank you both very much for your time today. And Allison, please thank your husband for his service. Thank you very much for listening to Leaders and Legends, brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated. If you want to contact us about this program or our menu of public relations services, please send us an email at robert at veteranstrategies.com. That's robert at veteranstrategies.com. Strategies.com.